Good morning. Thank you for being here. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce you Professor Mauricio Prato. He is a associate professor, no, full professor of the chemistry department in the Faculty of Pharmacy of the University of Trieste. He has been invited a speaker at the University of Yale, New Haven, University of California, and he was invited uh, by the Department of Chemistry of the Col Normal Superior in Paris, at the University of Namur in Belgium, University of Strasbourg, and uh, he has won many European grants, publishing more than 700 articles in high impact part factor international journals, with more than 17,000 citations, and uh, he has uh, won no, numerous awards, including the Blaise Pascal Medal from the European Academy of Science, the Natagold Medal by the Italian Chemical Society, the European Carbon Association Award, the French-Italian Chemical Society Award, the ACS Nano Leadership Award, and uh, he, his research interests include the organic functionalization of carbon nanomaterials for application in medicine, cell material science, the synthesis and structural determination of organic compounds with potential biological activity, new synthetic methods, organic and bioorganic reaction mechanisms. I really thank uh, Professor Mauricio Prato that he is a very good researcher and excellent person. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Mildred, for this very kind introduction. And first of all, I wish to thank you, all the organizing uh, committee and uh, Mildred in particular for inviting me to this important conference. Um, it is a, a real pity not to be there in Cancun, such a beautiful place, but uh, uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, traveling is difficult these times. And uh, I hope I can make it uh, uh, another time. Can you see my screen? I guess so. So today, the focus of my talk will be uh, interfaces. Interfaces are very important places where uh, many things happen. And uh, carbon interfaces are interesting for a number of uh, uh, reasons that I will try to uh, show to you. So if we look at the definition of interface, we see that uh, there are uh, many different, in different definitions, but fundamentally is a surface forming a common boundary of two bodies. But what is important is that uh, uh, the interface is where the action is. And uh, in order to understand this, uh, we usually focus on uh, uh, electrochemical interfaces, for instance. When we think at uh, interfaces, we usually uh, think at electrochemical interfaces. So the, the double layer and uh, the interfaces where uh, the uh, electron transfers occur, and so where, where the real uh, thing happens. There are also other uh, types of uh, interfaces in composites, for instance, uh, we have uh, a very common uh, product, industrial product, these epoxy resins uh, uh, containing carbon fibers. And uh, the interface between these two components is very important because usually uh, it, is, it is a critical point for crack formation and, and for, uh, uh, for deterioration of, of, the, of the resin. Uh, another important interface is uh, the so-called brain-machine interfaces. In practice, we have electrodes which are implanted uh, in, the, in the head of, of an individual in order to connect uh, his brain, his of her brain, uh, with a machine. And so in this way, for instance, we can connect the brain of a person to an arm, an, a, a mechanical arm, which can be moved uh, by this uh, uh, interface. Uh, 
And so if we, for instance, look at this, uh, this video, we see uh, a lady that uh, uh, was, was uh, paralyzed uh, uh, following a stroke. She can uh, move a mechanical arm and drink uh, coffee from, uh, from this bottle by using this uh, uh, implanted uh, uh, electrodes. If we look at the electrodes, the electrodes are usually metallic uh, because we need conduction uh, for uh, stimulation of record or recording. And uh, the, uh, the, um, there are two problems, two main problems with, this, uh, with these materials. Uh, one is that uh, the material has a too low surface area. Uh, this is a, a compact metal, and so there is no sufficient surface area. And so we need a lot of electrodes, I mean, a lot of electrodes to stimulate. Another issue is that uh, the biocompatibility. There is no uh, complete biocompatibility of these materials because, for instance, <clears throat> if we look at a simple electrode implanted into a brain of an animal, we see that usually this is a very small electrode. This will be about 100 microns in diameter. Uh, we can clearly see that uh, this, this uh, brighter part uh, is the scar which is generated by the implantation of this electrode. And so in practice, uh, the scar uh, <clears throat> is completely insulating. And so the, the uh, opposes to the, to the action of the electrode. And so this is a big problem which uh, should be solved somehow. And in practice, if we have a surface, for instance, a metallic surface, uh, there are several ways uh, we can control and improve surface performance and so <clears throat> upgrading uh, the, the role of the interface. And so for instance, on a metallic electrode, we can place, uh, for instance, a monolayer of graphene, uh, which then generates a 2D pattern or we can, we can put an array of carbon nanotubes in order to generate a 3D network. And uh, in doing this, we shape interfaces using carbon nanostructures at the molecular level uh, in order to create nanostructured interfaces for physical absorption, chemical absorption, enhanced surface area uh, to generate nanocatalysis and bio-inspired interfaces. So all these all these properties, all these applications can be uh, possible by using carbon nanostructures. And in particular, uh, the most popular carbon nanostructures, of course, are graphene and carbon nanotubes. Uh, and the particular characteristics of these materials is that uh, they possess uh, electron transduction. So they are very useful in electron transduction. This means that if we use a, a carbon interface between two different, uh, uh, two different media, like for instance, water and air, we have that uh, uh, passage of uh, charges is facilitated by this, uh, by this uh, uh, carbon interface. As, as it is well known that, uh, for instance, uh, an ion and cations in contact with the carbon nanotubes generate uh, charges, electrons, or holes on the surface of carbon nanotubes. And this, uh, knowing that carbon nanotubes can, uh, can uh, uh, flow electrons very, very efficiently and very fast, this is a very important characteristic. And so, for instance, if we want to substitute electron arrays made of metals, we can use, for instance, uh, uh, carpets of carbon nanotubes. So in this way, we increase a lot the, we increase a lot the uh, surface area. But what happens in terms of uh, biocompatibility? We have implanted uh, a, an elect a, a carbon nanotube sponge on the brain of a, of a, of a rat. And we have seen that uh, the animal lives perfectly uh, with these uh, nanotubes in the brain. Then we had to sacrifice the animal and see what happens. And as you can see, in this place where you see black, you should imagine that should be nanotubes here because nanotubes are not uh, 
uh, visible under this, uh, uh, these conditions. But you can clearly see that uh, the, uh, the uh, inflammation generated by carbon nanotubes uh, is very, very small. So it looks like the, the animal tolerates the brain of the animal, so the, the nervous system uh, tolerates very much the presence of carbon nanotubes, and there is a very, very small uh, level of, uh, of inflammation, as you can see from this, uh, uh, from this green, uh, this fluorescence. So we can also observe that uh, a, 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 this is a spectacular result in practice in the sponge of nanotubes introduced in the brain of the rat, we see that uh, uh, nerves are growing. These are nerve fibers that are growing in the sponge of carbon nanotubes. And if we observe the interface between the living matter and the carbon nanotube phase, we clearly see that uh, the living matter, so the, the nervous part of, of, the, of the brain is invading carbon, the carbon nanotube sponge and it is perfectly integrated with the carbon nanotubes. So we can say that at least at the level of uh, uh, central nervous system, we have a perfect compatibility of uh, nerves and carbon nanotubes. So uh, if we look at the morphology, we see that nerves and carbon nanotubes are very similar in shape. Although the, the uh, dimensions are, dif are different, but we reasoned several years ago, maybe 20 years ago, we reasoned that uh, since carbon nanotubes are metallic, uh, maybe they can help bridge nerves that do not communicate anymore because of injury. And so uh, in doing this, we thought about a spinal cord uh, diseases, spinal cord injury, uh, which is caused, this is a terrible disease which is caused by usually by an accident. And what happens is that the, the, the spinal cord is displaced by the, by the accident. And uh, in practice, there is no communication between the brain and the organs controlled by, uh, by the nerves below the, uh, the spinal cord injury. And so in practice, what happens is that in the site of injury, uh, scars start to be created, start to form. And uh, what we can say is that um, the scars are insulating, so they oppose to the formation of fibers between the two parts. And so the communication is completely prohibited between the two parts. And uh, uh, this, of course, uh, leads to uh, partial or complete paralysis. So this is a very damaging disease and there are currently no uh, cures uh, to, to, to have people uh, paralyzed to start walking again. And so what we, what we reasoned several year, years ago was if we place carbon nanotubes in this position where the accident, I mean, where the, uh, injury occurred, maybe uh, we can regenerate the electrical signal between the two parts of the spinal cord <coughs> lesions. And so we started from scratch uh, in the sense that we, have to, we had to start with simple experiments, in vitro experiments. So we take a glass cover slip, we cover it with uh, functionalized carbon nanotubes, and then we heat to high temperatures under nitrogen in order to uh, attach the nanotubes to the surface of, of carbon of, of, of the glass cover slip. And then we, we place hippocampal neur neonatal hippocampal neurons on top of the nanotube layers. And then we let them incubate for a couple of weeks. <clears throat> we check that the surface of the nanotubes is perfect. And then we can observe the formation, I mean, the, the, the growth of uh, neurons. All these um, bodies that you see are uh, neurons, uh, single neurons that have they've grown uh, 
on, on the layer of carbon nanotubes. So these are carbon nanotubes and these are neurons. This is a soma. And what, what the neurons do, they elongate dendrites in order to communicate with the other uh, neurons. So for instance, we can see that this neuron is communicating with this neuron, with this other neuron. They form clusters of communication. And this is another uh, neuron that is communicating with these neurons. If we enlarge the image, we can clearly see the uh, synapses occurring between these two neurons. Uh, this is the uh, dendrite of, this, of that uh, neuron, which is uh, communicating with this other neuron. But if we enlarge it even more, we can clearly see nanotubes all over the places. And what we can do uh, in collaboration with Professor Laura Ballerini is that uh, uh, <clears throat> we have the so-called patch clamp technique. In practice, this is a, this is a, nano, a micro pipette which uh, contains an electrode and this electrode is placed in contact with the main soma of the neuron. And so in practice with this uh, electrode, we can either stimulate the neuron or we can uh, register, we can record the spontaneous activity or the stimulated activity of the neurons. And what we observed in the first experiments was very encouraging. If we look at the uh, so-called uh, um, post-synaptic currents uh, in the control, so uh, neurons deposited on, on pure glass, we see that this is a neuron which is communicating with other neurons. And you can see that uh, in a couple of seconds, it is communicating with one, two, three, four signals. In the same range of time, non neurons deposited on carbon nanotubes have much higher uh, activity. So they communicate much more with the other neurons. And if we use another technique, these are called uh, action potentials. Uh, we have a huge increase of signals that one single neuron is, is sending to the other neurons to communicate. And so the reason uh, for this increased frequency of activity of neurons on carbon nanotubes is probably due to the uh, direct electrical coupling uh, of uh, neurons uh, through the action of carbon nanotubes. So this, there is a shortcut uh, generated by carbon nanotubes between the two between the two parts of the of the of the of the neuron. And what we can see is that uh, we have an increased number of uh, synapses, which can be uh, detected by using uh, fluorescence experiments. And we can see that in the case of carbon nanotubes, we have an increased number of synapses. If we look at uh, another experiment by cutting the transversal sections of the glass cover slip, we can see that this is the glass, this is the layer of carbon nanotubes, and this is a neuron. And we can see this is a neuron which is floating on the layer of carbon nanotubes. But in some cases, we can see that the, a nanotube is pinching the, the cell membrane of, of the neuron. And so this means that uh, somehow this neuron is connected to the layer of carbon nanotubes, which being metallic, they can, uh, they can clearly uh, carry out electrons along this, uh, this, uh, this layer. And so, after these experiments, we decided to go on with some more complex experiments. We go from single cell to the entire uh, organ. In this case, we take uh, slices of spinal cord. We deposit them on the carbon nanotube layers, and we record the uh, spontaneous activity of these two uh, slices. And we can also stimulate one of the two spinal cord slices and see what happens in the same slice and see also on the other slice. And this is the morphology of the system. We, we can see these are the two spinal cord explants uh, on, on the, on the uh, I mean, this, these are placed on the control, which is uh, uh, chicken plasma. This is a nutrient for, for the spinal cord explants. And we can see that uh, these are nerves created by the spinal cord, uh, but they don't go towards each other. They, they, are, they are very strong in nature. They are very thick, uh, very thick fibers. 
in the case of carbon nanotubes, we can see that uh, between the tri sp two spinal cord slices, we have a very intense net of, uh, of nerves created by the two spinal cord explants. And so if we look at the, the spontaneous activity of these two uh, spinal cord explants, we can see that uh, they communicate, but there is no, no communication between the two uh, slices. Uh, the two slices are completely independent. And if we stimulate one of the two slices, you see this, this dot is a stimulation. And so the same slice immediately reacts and other, and other inputs and then reacts. In the other case, we see no reaction whatsoever. So there is no communication between the two slices. In the case of, of, of carbon nanotubes, we can clearly see that the two slices communicate very efficiently and they are completely synchronized, uh, still at the spontaneous level. But then if we stimulate one, you see here, stimulate one, one reacts immediately, but the other one reacts immediately as well. And so this means that now the two spinal cord explants are completely synchronized and they behave like a single organ. So this is very encouraging and we can go on with some uh, in vivo experiments. And now we can place the nanotube sponge in the spinal cord. So we generate a lesion here. So we can cut a, a small part of the, of the uh, spinal cord. And we can place carbon nanotubes in the, in the lesion sites. And then we can observe, for instance, after four months, we can see that uh, when we use polyethylene glycol, which is a reference for this, uh, for this experiment, we don't see anything here. So the, where the cut was, now there is a scar and uh, the, uh, the, the lesion has completely collapsed. And uh, in the case of uh, carbon nanotubes here, we see that uh, the, uh, the lesion is still there and so the carbon nanotubes here have uh, remained in place and the, the lesion has not collapsed. And uh, so this means that uh, somehow something has happened and we can follow the formation of, uh, of nerves by using uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging in explanted spinal cords. These experiments were conducted by Pedro Ramos Cabrer at SIC Biomagune in collaboration with uh, Professor Laura Ballerini in Trieste. And so this is, this is the, the spinal cord of the lesion. You can see that where the lesion is, there is nothing. So probably here we have scars. The scars are invisible in the, in the MRI. When we use uh, carbon nanotubes, you don't see the carbon nanotubes, but you see the fibers that have grown in place here. And so this means that uh, uh, the carbon nanotubes have favored the formation of, uh, of uh, fibers, nerve fibers in the place of the lesion. And so after this, we have to understand whether the animal reacts uh, positively to the implantation of carbon nanotubes. And so there are some, uh, uh, some behavioral assessments in order to see whether uh, the animal recovers faster when we use carbon nanotubes because the animals, unfortunately, I mean, good for them, but uh, unfortunately they recover anyway. So we have to compare uh, the animal in terms of uh, efficient recovery. And so this is a sort of uh, locomotor rating. Uh, this is a test which is used in these cases. And we can see that uh, this is the score for the healthy rats. Immediately after the lesion, we have a, a, a decrease of this, uh, of this uh, rating. But we can see immediately that even after one day, the, uh, the, the uh, rating is higher for uh, animals implanted with carbon nanotubes. And so 
the, the in general, the recovery uh, towards complete recovery is, is faster in the case of carbon nanotubes. Also, we can see uh, these other, this is called horizontal ladder uh, rank test. We see also in this case, that we start with five and we have an immediate decrease of, of, of the score, but uh, you can clearly see that in the case of carbon nanotubes, the, the decrease in the score is much less than, uh, than uh, uh, in the absence of carbon nanotubes. Also, this is, a, uh, this is called footprint analysis. So in practice, you see how the animal places the, the paw uh, on the ground. And we can see that uh, in the case of carbon nanotubes, we have an efficient recovery after just one day. You see eight animals recover mostly after one day, whereas in the case of the, uh, the uh, standard polyethylene glycol, we see that it takes a few days, even one week, to recover in, in three different cases. And so in practice, we can say that uh, uh, carbon nanotubes uh, favor interneuronal communication, mainly uh, due to their shape and their electronic properties. Uh, carbon nanotube sponges favor the formation of nerve fibers in the lesion site, and uh, properly functionalized carbon nanotubes might play a role in the reconstruction of damaged neuronal tissues. So it is very important that uh, we continue this work because it might be that one day we will be able to, to do uh, human experiments and uh, to make sure that uh, this approach will work. In, by, by switching to another type of, uh, of uh, interface, we have that this interface for a completely different application. We switch now from uh, uh, biomedical applications to energy application. And now we have carbon nanotubes can be wrapped by a metal oxide layer incorporating metal nanoparticles. And we can play with uh, different uh, metal oxides like uh, titanium oxide, zirconium oxide, and cerium oxide, and different nanoparticles, maybe uh, mainly uh, platinum and palladium. In order to start, we need to generate nanoparticles incorporated in, uh, in metal oxide. So we start with uh, uh, platinum or palladium nanoparticles. Uh, we switch the labile uh, dodecylamine ligand with uh, this uh, mercaptan decanoic acid. So now we have a palladium, platinum or palladium nanoparticle surrounded by acidic functions. And we can do a sol gel experiment in which we take titanium uh, tetrabutoxide is a starting material for, for titanium oxide formation. And the formation will take place at the, at the uh, top layer of the nanoparticles because of the presence of, of the carboxylic groups. And so we can uh, now generate these uh, layers of uh, uh, titanium oxide incorporating uh, palladium or uh, platinum nanoparticles. If we start with carbon nanotubes, now we need to oxidize carbon nanotubes in order to generate carboxylic functions. And so now we can again do the, perform the sol gel process by incorporating also metallic nanoparticles. So now we will have nanotubes surrounded by a layer of, uh, a multi-layer of uh, titanium or, or zirconium or cerium oxide incorporating incorporating palladium or platinum nanoparticles. And we can observe now, we start with this type of carbon nanotubes and after the formation, after the sol gel, we can clearly see that now the nanotubes are thicker and uh, they, are, they are covered by, by the, uh, the metal oxide layers. We can uh, uh, study the morphology by using a transmission electron microscopy. In some cases, we can clearly see that uh, uh, the uh, nanoparticles are, are, are uh, crystalline, but we can clearly see that the nanotubes now 
are covered by, by in this case, by cerium oxide. In some cases, we can see that uh, the, the, this, um, the, the layer of is missing. Uh, we can also see by using uh, uh, by using uh, high resolution electron microscopy, we can see the carbon uh, carbon uh, atoms and the, and the cerium atoms. And we could use this uh, catalyst catalyst for the water gas shift reaction. The water gas shift reaction is an important reaction, uh, starting with carbon monoxide and water to generate carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Uh, which is used for, an, for a number of application, applications, in particular for the generation of ultra-pure hydrogen. Uh, my colleague, uh, Paolo Fornasiero, tested this system so palladium nanoparticles incorporated in cerium oxide deposited on aluminum, on alumina as the catalyst. And what they observed that the reaction performed at 350 degrees uh, decreases its efficiency uh, with, uh, with time. So after one hour, the, the conversion of CO decreases a lot and it needs some uh, air exposure to reoxidize the cerium oxide in order to find again the same efficiency. So we, we compare this system having deposited on alumina with the system uh, deposited on, on carbon nanotubes. So now we can use different percentages of uh, carbon nanotubes with palladium uh, in, inside cerium oxide. And you can see clearly that, first of all, we, we decrease the temperature from 350 to 250. And now the water gas shift reaction proceeds without any loss of efficiency. And even if we heat to 450 degrees for six hours, uh, simulating and accelerating aging, we still see that uh, the conversion is very, very efficient. So <clears throat> in this case, we know that, that the carbon nanotubes the, uh, produce much more efficiency, generate much more efficiency than in the case of alumina. But uh, of course, if we want to produce hydrogen, there are better ways of producing hydrogen. And so for instance, we can uh, use the direct reduction of water to hydrogen uh, by using uh, modified electrodes. And so we can use, in practice, this would be a, a catalytic electrolysis of, uh, of water. And so first of all, we, we need to generate uh, carboxylic acids on the surface of carbon nanotubes. In this case, we, we use the uh, uh, two reaction, the diethonium reaction to attach these carboxylic functions on top of carbon nanotubes. Then we generated this whole gel process to attach the titanium oxide incorporating palladium nanoparticles on top of the uh, carbon nanotubes. And then we calcinate in order to eliminate the organic part. And so now we have, this is another way of generating uh, palladium nanoparticles in titanium oxide on the surface of carbon nanotubes. And so in this case, we deposit this uh, slurry of this material on the, on the glassy carbon electrode, and uh, we use linear sweep voltammetry to see the efficiency of uh, uh, reducing uh, water to hydrogen. And we can see from, from this plot here that, first of all, the bare plastic carbon electrode does not produce any current, but we can see that uh, these are the uh, catalysts without carbon nanotubes, and these are the catalysts with carbon nanotubes. And we can clearly see that we have a shift in over potential of 200 millivolts when we use carbon nanotubes. And not only this, we have an increase in turnover frequency. You see more than two orders of magnitudes when we go from the bare catalyst to the uh, catalyst on carbon nanotubes. And so the transmission electron microscopy shows that uh, the carbon nanotubes are now covered with uh, titanium oxide. You can see here the layer of titanium oxide. 
And what we reason is that uh, the water is, is, <clears throat> is a, uh, attracted by the titanium oxide and then uh, hydrogen, the protons are reduced by uh, the catalyst <clears throat> and the current to hydrogen. But of course, <clears throat> if you reduce, if we reduce uh, protons to hydrogen, then we have a problem with the oxygen uh, because of course we, in this process, if we generate uh, hydrogen from, uh, from uh, water, uh, we generate uh, OH minus. And this of course, in the end uh, is completely uh, a negative effect. So if we want a complete split in water, we need to, oxidize oxygen to water, uh, water to oxygen and reduce hydrogen, protons to hydrogen. And uh, the splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen is a very uh, difficult process because uh, of the two processes, the oxidation of water to oxygen uh, is much more difficult than the reduction of protons to hydrogen. So once we have oxidized water to oxygen, we can reduce very easily protons to, to hydrogen. And, uh, but the, the, as I said, the, the oxidation of water to oxygen is very expensive in terms of energy and uh, requires very high temperatures and also electrochemically uh, is very expensive. So there are many catalysts that have been uh, uh, devised in the course of the years. Uh, this is the natural catalyst containing four manganese atoms and one calcium atom. <clears throat> this is the famous blue dimer uh, by Mayer. And this is the uh, cobalt uh, catalyst by, by Nocera. Um, <clears throat> we decided in collaboration with Professor Marcella Bonchio in Padova, we decided to use this ruthenium catalyst, uh, which is uh, a polyoxometallate. Uh, so we have uh, tungsten atoms, a, a skeleton of tungsten atoms with oxygen bridges uh, surrounding four ruthenium atoms, uh, which the, the whole polyoxometallate uh, possesses 10 negative charges. This is the X-ray structure of the, of the catalyst. You can see these are the, the uh, ruthenium atoms and they are arranged in this way in a adamantine like uh, structure and uh, the, which resembles somehow the, 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 four the four manganese atoms present in the natural system. <clears throat> the ruthenium atoms are at the stage oxidation, oxidation stage of four. And once we oxidize them to ruthenium five, water is oxidized to oxygen. And so if we use cerium four to oxidize all the ruthenium to ruthenium five, we have that the water is oxidized to oxygen and <clears throat> the oxidation of water to oxygen can be followed uh, with very high turnover numbers and very high turnover frequencies. So now nature teaches us that uh, the water can be oxidized to oxygen by using light. And, uh, and so inspired by, by nature, we decided to, to embark in a, in, a, in a project in which we use a photosensitizer. But uh, this is the photosensitizer, which is usually used uh, for many different reactions, uh, the ruthenium 3 dp But this, this catalyst is very labile. And so we decided to use a much more robust organic dye, uh, which is perylimbicimide, because the perylimbicimide, once excited, is a very, it's a very strong oxidant. And so the perylimbicimides share a very uh, high number of uh, good properties, which is they have a wide absorption range, they are fluorescent, their homolumo energies can be mod modulated by using <clears throat> substituents in the core of the perylene. Uh, and they are very strong and robust oxidants upon visible excitation. And so in practice, we have a system in which we have the catalyst, which is the ruthenium 
polyoxometalate. The photosensitizer, which is the routine, the, the perylene BC mite, possessing two positive charges uh, because of uh, the need to work in water. So we need to, to, to have some solubility in water. And also we want to combine the positive charges of this uh, uh, perylene BC mite with the 10 negative charges of the catalyst. So in practice, if we have two positive charges here, we can say that by, by uh, electrostatic attraction, we can place five uh, perilimbicimides uh, to, to, to for, for the 10 negative charges of the, of the ruthenium uh, pole. And then we need a, a sacrificial agent. So this is uh, uh, persulfate, ammonium persulfate, which will uh, uh, close the circuit, in, in the, which is this one, basically. So we, uh, we throw light on the perilimbicimide. The perilimbicimide becomes a strong oxidant. It will oxidize this polyoxometalate. And then this polyoxometalate, in turn, will oxidize water to oxygen. And then uh, the persulfate will take the electron for a perylene BC mite, which will go back to neutrality and will be ready for, a, for another cycle. And so the perylene BC mites uh, agglomerate in water, they aggregate in water, and this aggregation can be easily followed by, by UV visible uh, spectroscopy. This is the work that <clears throat> the group of Frank Wurzner has done in the course of the years. Uh, in practice, we have the monomer, which decreases in absorption, and the aggregated species will increases in, uh, in, uh, in absorption. And in practice, when we have the perylene BC mice in water, we have this aggregation. But when we place the polyoxometalate, we have some uh, change in the, in the absorption spectrum because we have the creation of a new, new species. And the new species is created by a, a, a ratio of five to two of the perylene BC mite to the, the uh, ruthenium polyoxometalate. In practice, by either absorption spectroscopy or conductimetric experiment, we see that we need five perylene BC mite to uh, contrapose the, the 10 negative charges of, of the polyoxometalate. And so by using this scheme, we can say that uh, then the, the perylene BC mite will, will also aggregate among themselves. So we expect to have a, a multi-layer of this material. And what we can do is to study by using SACS uh, so small angle X-ray uh, scattering in collaboration with a group of uh, Dr. Amenish at Electron Synchrotron in Fiesta. And what we can see is that the diffraction generated by uh, the heavy atoms, so the ruthenium atoms and tungsten atoms, uh, is clearly visible by Sachs experiments. And so we have a distance of 1.6 in this direction, nanometers in this direction and uh, 2.3 nanometers in this direction. And so we can imagine a, 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 a layer of uh, disaggregated species uh, in which we have a distance of 1.6 nanometers here, but we have also 2.3 nanometers uh, in between the different layers. Uh, and so this is a generation of uh, to the hierarchical assembly. And uh, we can also see uh, by using SACS uh, the presence of uh, extra uh, laminar aggregate. And so in practice, to sum up, uh, we can say that uh, the perylene BC mites uh, will surround the polyoxometalates in, in five to one ratio. And this will form this uh, unit, which we call quantason because this is the, the smallest, I mean, the, quant the natural quantason is the smallest uh, photosynthetic unit, which was postulated uh, 
uh, 40, 50 years ago. And we saw, we call this the artificial quantasome because this is the smallest uh, photosynthetic unit which we can create uh, using this system. And this macromolecular system now uh, is about 9.89 nanometers uh, in, uh, in uh, height and 50, more than 50 nanometers in length uh, with the, the difference in, in the layers of 2.3 nanometers. And this is the mean strength of the uh, natural chloroplast membrane, which possesses these uh, stacks. Uh, and so if we place this material in water for water oxidation in the presence of uh, persulfate and we radiate this system, uh, in practice, what this is what we already mentioned before. So the, the, the perilimbicimide will uh, will be excited, they will oxidize the polyoxymetalate, the oxymetalate will uh, oxidize water to oxygen. And so we can follow the uh, formation of oxygen. Uh, and we can see that uh, the, by increasing the, the concentration of rutinium polyoxymetalate, we have an increase of the number of uh, moles of oxygen by arriving to reaching a plateau at about 0 0.2 in ratio between uh, ROM, RUFOM uh, and uh, perilimbicimide. And also we have an increase in the rate of formation of, uh, of uh, oxygen by using uh, higher concentrations of rutinium uh, foam. If we deposit the slurry of, uh, of the quantasome on the surface of uh, tungsten oxide uh, nanostructures, not tungsten oxide, we generate a photo anode. And so we have a faradic, faradic uh, uh, yield of 97% with uh, an absorption to photon uh, efficiency of 1.3. Uh, and we will see that this is a very high number, absorbed photon to current efficiency. And uh, you can see that uh, in the dark, there is no uh, current. Uh, in the presence of light, we have an increase of current, and this generates uh, oxygen by oxidizing water. And so in practice, if we compare our system with the state-of-the-art photoanodes by several different groups, we, we can see that uh, in our case, we have the higher absorbed photon APCI, APC conversion efficiency. And so this is a very promising system for the oxidation of, uh, of water to oxygen. And of course, uh, by eventually, uh, we can conclude by saying that we have generated uh, an artificial leaf in which water can be oxidized on one side to oxygen, on the other side can be reduced to hydrogen. And we are still uh, uh, working on this, uh, on this uh, concept of artificial quantasome in order to optimize the performances. So I hope that uh, I showed you how important is the interface, especially carbon interfaces in number of applications. And if you work on carbon inter on, on, on interfaces, try to, to use interfaces for important applications in order to have important applications in different fields so that the interface will play a crucial role and uh, uh, will, will bring uh, new and uh, exciting results. Uh, this is the conclusion of my talk. Uh, this is a very interdisciplinary work. And I have to thank several people, all my group for the synthesis and Professor Paolo Fornasier and Dr. Michele Melchionna for the synthesis of the materials. Uh, the group of Francesco Paolucci in Bologna for the electrochemistry, the group of uh, Heinz Hamenisch for the Sachs experiments, uh, Carlo Bignozzi for the device, Marcella Bonchio for the water splitting, and Laura Ballerini for the uh, spinal cord experiments, and all of you for your kind attention.
Thank you, Mauricio, for your very nice talk. Now we have time for questions. There is one, please. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you. Quite the amazing talk. Uh, I have a few questions in regards to the first application you mentioned with carbon nanotubes and uh, relating to uh, neuroscience. Uh, you mentioned the carbon nanotubes promote, uh, well, the results you showed uh, uh, that carbon nanotubes uh, promote neuron growth and connection between neurons in damaged areas. Uh, my question is, what happens to the carbon nanotubes after the procedure of, or the, after the growth has been completed, per se? And uh, what happens to them after the neurons have uh, connected again? Uh, as, as far as I understand, uh, they remain intact. There is nothing that happens to the nanotubes. So they will stay there. Uh, I mean, in principle, they are very robust and are not easily degraded. So what I expect is that uh, they will stay there and uh, they will remain forever in place. And uh, lastly, uh, you mentioned uh, the very end of this uh, kind of medical application that hopefully one day we will be applying this to um, humans. And my question would be, how much more complex would you think it would be? Uh, well, there are several problems related to this. Well, first of all, uh, as you may know, uh, experimentation with humans is not easy. Uh, you need to go through a numerous different steps uh, to convince the authorities. Uh, even though we, we receive uh, many, many applications to, to act as volunteers, uh, but of course this is not possible at the moment until uh, uh, this matter is regulated uh, uh, by the authorities. Um, the, the, the problem I see uh, is related to uh, the, the chronicity of this illness. So in practice, uh, when, when an accident occurs, uh, scars are immediately formed. And so this will oppose uh, to the formation of fibers. And so in, in practice, I believe that uh, uh, if you want to, to do something, you have to, uh, to scratch these cars and place carbon nanotubes in place. So this, this might be a problem, of course. Um, okay. okay, well, thank you. Another question? No. I, I will ask uh, something. Uh, the system of, of the peeling with the pump and couplet with the carbon nanotubes and serum uh, on top, it is very, very interesting. And what do you think is the possibility that in the future we will have a cells, fuel cells, or devices to produce, uh, hydro uh, yeah, uh, to produce hydrogen for cars, for example. Because um, I don't know how is the, um, the possibility to have enough materials for this kind of devices. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think this is, uh, I mean, in, in, in principle, this is an easy process which can be scaled up uh, very easily. And so I don't see any problems in, uh, in uh, using this system for, for uh, large scale production. Okay. 
if 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 this is uh, uh, I mean we we haven't uh, tried on on a large scale, but I believe that I mean we are working on this in the sense that uh, um, you know the the the, the step from. Uh, from uh, pure research to application is always not straightforward. So uh, you, you need to do a lot of, uh, of uh, optimization before, before going into practical application. But uh, for sure, this is one of our main goals, yes. Okay, thank you. There is another question there, please. Uh, thanks for your talk. I want to know your opinion about it. If any material can do the water splitting uh, process, can be considered as the artificial leaf, or what need the material to be considered that? Uh, <laughs> well, the the the. the the word, the word artificial photosynthesis means that uh, you are producing, uh, uh, I mean, in general, either you are producing uh, oxygen on one side and hydrogen on the other side, or you are producing uh, oxygen on one side and, and uh, uh, reduction of uh, carbon dioxide on the other. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we are not the only ones working on these systems. There are many, many groups. Uh, there, is a, there is a huge consortium uh, in the United States, which is uh, financed with a lot of money that uh, works on different systems. Uh, other systems, for instance, are uh, silicon nanowires or other types of nanowires. And uh, the in practice, you can use, yeah, I mean, this is not uh, my, my, let's say, patent that uh, it is not called, uh, this is in general called artificial photosynthesis, it's not my own title. So any, any uh, material uh, that produces uh, oxygen on one side and uh, hydrogen or or formic acid or other carbon materials on the other side is, uh, can be called artificial photosynthesis. Thank you. Any other question? There, there is another. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Sam, for this amazing talk. And my question is, uh, when you were talking about the interactions between nanotubes and the neuron, uh, do you know if there are any in silico way to obtain and analyze these interactions and results before doing the experimental in vivo part? I don't know, maybe a molecular model or something like that? Thank you. Well, in, you know, I think in principle, yes, but uh, I'm not uh, sufficiently expert to say that there, there are possibilities. Uh, of course, uh, nanotubes are already uh, a complex material, but uh, the living matter is even more complex. So I don't know if <clears throat> there should be the possibility to, uh, to model neurons, but uh, I'm not sure this is very easy because uh, modeling the biological systems is, is very, very difficult. Thank you. Any other? Okay. Thank you, Mauricio, for your wonderful talk. And thank you to all of you to be here. For thank being you here. very much. Thank you. Yeah. Excuse me, there is one question. <laughs> Are you there, Steve? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm sorry. Um, I have a question about the uh, uh, spinal cord injury. Do you expect uh, a side effect, a negative side effect of the use of uh, nano, uh, nanocarbon tubes? Uh, 
Yes, in principle, in principle, uh, carbon nanotubes have been considered relatively toxic in many instances. However, uh, in our case, I believe that uh, the nanotubes should stay uh, implanted in the lesion site and they should not move around. So I believe that uh, eventually they will be part of the body and uh, in practice, they should not do any harm. Uh, although I cannot say this uh, with complete uh, certainty because of course you have to do the experiments. However, the, the animals that we implanted uh, uh, before they, they were sacrificed, they lived for eight months uh, with, with, and they, they lived a, a completely uh, standard life. So uh, my, my opinion is that uh, uh, they should stay there and they should not uh, produce any side effects. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mauricio. And I hope next time you can be here. Thanks. Thank you.